<laughs> Welcome everyone. Um, so conserving water in the garden with rain barrels. We will be starting in just two minutes, but since this is a bilingual webinar, there's a couple of things that you need to know. Um, you need to go to the bottom of the screen where there is um, and click on the interpretation button. It's a globe icon and you need to select a room. There's an English room and a Spanish room. You need to be sure that you're in whichever room that you are wanting to listen to that language. Additionally, um, there is a live transcript button at the top at the bottom of your screen. If you would not like to see the transcript, then you can hide it by selecting hide subtitle. Bienvenidos, por favor escoja su idioma de preferencia en la barra de herramientas en la parte de abajo de la pantalla, de pantalla presionada el botón de interpretación y también presion, presione el mute original audio. Necesita tener la versión axilada de Zoom. Los subtítulos cerrados están habilitados para este sem seminario web. Para desactivar esta configuración, seleccione Live Transcript en la parte inferior de la pantalla y seleccione Hide Subtitle. We're giving everyone just another couple of minutes to join and then we will get started. Thank you. I already opened one and I accidentally opened a different one. Okay, welcome once again, and thank you for joining us. I would ask that you would keep yourself muted. You can use the chat if you have any questions during any part of the lecture today, and we will be monitoring the chat as well as having question breaks. Um, I have been really excited to partner with the city of Greeley today and would like to turn it over to Ruth Quaid. Thank you. Are you gonna change the slides for me? Jessica? Yes. Can you okay. see the Yep. Slide? Okay. It's changing. All right. Um, so as Jessica told you, tonight is the rain barrel one. Um, very popular the last couple of years is our Life After Lawn Bluegrass Retrofit Program. We're getting a little bit later start this year, but that is going to be on February 23rd. For, so two weeks from tonight, um, same time, six o'clock we will be doing the Life After Lawn program. Um, some other classes I'm going to have, but I don't have dates on yet, are using native plants in your garden. Um, we're going to do a hands-on class, how to build a crevice garden. You'll see a picture of what a crevice garden is over on the right. It's um, kind of like a rock garden and you can lay your stones out flat like that, or you can do them upright, kind of like mountains are. Um, it's a really, cool way to garden and deal with slopes and problem areas. And then Jessica and I were just talking about uh, possibly doing a rain garden, how to build a rain garden and um, keep the water on your property and then also be able to use it to water your plants. Okay. Um, I'm also considering doing, uh, I've been asked by a couple people in our office to do a beginner class. So I was thinking about a Botany 101, basic Xeriscape. So, you know, the seven principles, pretty uh, simple Xeriscape class. Demystifying fertilizers, because a lot of people don't understand what those numbers mean on the box. Um, and if you're going to do rock in your garden, how to do it right so it doesn't look like a parking lot. 
and then um, just some basic design principles. So not necessarily how to draw your design, but as you're planting in your garden, basic things you can do to just make it more attractive. And then lastly, um, how to build a pathway. So those are some of the things I'm thinking about doing. Those would be mini classes, maybe 30 minutes and um, doing those you know, fairly quickly, like one a week for a month or something. Okay. Um, some upcoming things we have going on is we're going to be at the Home and Garden Show down at Island Grove, March 4th, 5th, and 6th. We're going, we're doing a push to get people to sign up on WaterSmart, our customer portal. So you could come ask your questions. We're going to be doing a showerhead exchange, bring in an old shower head or shower heads. You can do more than one and we will give you brand new ones. Also faucet aerators. And then we'll be doing some giveaways as we always do. We've always got the fun swag to give out. And then lastly, I'd like to remind you that Garden in a Box goes on sale March 1st. You can pick them up in May. It'll be May 25th. Um, and that will be down at Island Grove this year. In the past, I've done it at my Xeriscape garden. And I just listed some of the gardens there. There'll be one native. There's five that are full sun, some part shade. And then this year they're doing these six packs. Um, you can see in the picture over there. So it'd be, I'm assuming six plants for $38. Some people think that um, the garden in a box is expensive. When you compare it to going to the nursery, it's really not. But um, there are some for $38 if you just wanna get started or fill in some spaces. And next. And we're back to this. So I'm gonna let Jessica take it away. Um, I do wanna mention if you've got the gallery view up here in the corner, um, you could see the gallery view and then two lines and one line. In some of the slides, it might be covering up your text. So you might wanna put it on the second to smallest one so you could still see your speaker, but you don't, it's not covering up your text. I hope that's okay, I said that, Jessica. Thank you so much, Ruth. I would like to just let everyone know that, you know, the city of Greeley sponsored this class to make it free for everyone to attend. I know that not all of you are in the city of Greeley um, boundaries. And so we'll be talking about some specific resources like Ruth mentioned from the city of Greeley, but then also other ways you can engage with your municipality if you are not in Greeley. A little bit about me. Um, I am the Education Outreach Manager at the CSU Colorado Stormwater Center. I love giving these talks about rain barrels and rain gardens and different ways that you can conserve water and use rainwater on your landscape. My email address and phone number are here. So if you have any questions after this uh, lecture today about any of these topics, feel free to contact me at any time. In case you're not familiar with the Colorado Stormwater Center, we are part of Colorado State University, like I mentioned, and we advance stormwater management through Colorado by conducting practical research and providing education and training opportunities like this, because stormwater is managed not only by municipalities and stormwater professionals, but by everyone. We have um, four main tenets to the Colorado Stormwater Center. One is trainings, we do certifications. Those are mainly geared at stormwater managers at this time. I'd also like to say that kind of moving forward, starting at this slide and moving forward, all of the blue lettering are links. So when you receive this presentation after today, you can go back and you can click on any of these links to learn more information. So we have our trainings and certifications. We also do relevant stormwater research. We provide resources. We're working on developing a lot of different resources right now. We have a very strong focus on language justice and we are translating or in the process of translating our, um, our certifications into Spanish and making them available to the Latino and Spanish speaking community, as well as our resources page, making sure that all of the resources that we have are available in both languages. We also have a symposium every year 
the 2022 symposium date has not been set yet, um, but to stay up to date on all of our free trainings or upcoming events, please join our newsletter and you'll be able to do that once you receive this training and you can go to that, um, navigate to that page. So for today, here is the outline what we're going to be talking about. We're going to start with, you know, why is it important to conserve water? What is rainwater harvesting? Um, Colorado has specific rain barrel regulations that are important to know. The type of rain barrel system to install, what materials you need, and then we'll get into specific steps on how to install your rain barrel or rain barrels. And finally, be talking about how to winterize and maintain and some frequently asked questions about rain barrels. Additionally, you might have noticed that I have some supplies here. At the very end, I'll be going through kind of a show and tell of the different components of a rain barrel kit and show you some tips and tricks that I have learned along the way. Okay, so first, where is the water? Um, why are we having issues around the amount of water that's available? So we have this decreased water availability because of climate change. We saw this this year with earlier in the season how we had no snow. Um, that was very concerning for everyone. We were wondering if we were going to have a major drought year. Drought has become more of um, an, a more often occurrence than really it being an occasional event. So drought is becoming much more common. Um, luckily we did get a lot of snow and that has increased our snowpack, but we are still facing decreases in our water levels and water is not as plentiful as it was before. Um, complicating that factor is we have increases in population. Like a lot of people, myself included, and we move from different parts of the state. We love Colorado and we stay here. So Colorado is seeing a substantial increases in population every year, meaning that as our the water that we have is now being split between more and more people, decreasing the amount of water we have. There are increasing priorities for water. Now, what does that mean? Um, the way that water rights work in Colorado, very briefly, is it's all based on the doctrine of prior appropriation. So that means that the first person to come and use water has a right to use that water. So historically, agriculture was the first person to put water to beneficial use or use it to do something good. Um, as we have continued um, to grow, there have been more and more priorities. There have been environmental rights, water rights, how much water needs to be in the river to protect to protect fish and, um, and aquatic species. We have recreation, how much water needs to be in there to recreate appropriately. We have municipal or drinking water uses. We have industrial uses. So now there are all of these increasing uses of water and we need to split that remaining water in all of those different directions. Now with, the, with water rights, you might think that, um, let's say there's a hundred people in line and in years of plenty, everyone gets their water right or their water allocation. You might think in drought years that everyone would just get a little bit less so that everyone could have water, but that's not the way that the water rights system works in Colorado. The first person in line gets their entire allocation. The next person gets their entire allocation until all of the water is used up. And then the people who have the more junior water rights don't get any water. So you might imagine that would be very stressful for people who rely on that water. Climate change is also really impacting the amount of water that we have available. Um, climate change is, is causing that increasing periods of drought, as well as the fires that we have seen, especially here in Colorado. And finally, high water use. Irrigation is used is the highest water use out 50% of the water that we use in Colorado and that's in the summer months. And that is used on our lawns. And so you might think that, well, it can't be that much water. I mean, 124 to 186 gallons for 100 square feet doesn't sound like all that much, um, but 100 square feet is about the size of an SUV. So I think we can all agree that that's a very small patch of lawn. So let's think about this um, and related to the city of Greeley. So in the city of Greeley, there's approximately 38,000 homes. That means that over 7 million gallons per week of water is being used on lawns 
because I think we can say that those homes have at least an SUV size square of lawn, and a lot of them have substantially more than that. So that is a lot of water. In the US, the average American uses 160 to 200 gallons of water per day. As I mentioned, about 50% of that is for outdoor use. And then in the home, the toilet is 12%, that's the highest water use. And then the shower and bath, I kind of combine them, it's 11% for shower and 1% for bath. Something that might be surprising to you is that 1% for the dishwasher. Um, I use my dishwasher daily, but dishwashers are very water efficient. And especially if you load it completely full when you run it, you're not using that much water. So that's why that is so low. And then one more thing that I'd like to point out is leaks. So 5% for leaks, that's a lot of water. Um, I live on a little bit of property and we had goats. And one day we found out that one of the goats had turned on the spigot in our field with its horn and it ran for a day and a half before we knew that it was even on. That was a lot of water that was happening because we didn't know a leak was happening. So I signed up for a system called Eye on Water and Ruth will have to say what the system is in Greeley, but it's a smart meter and you can sign up for notifications whenever there's a leak. And a lot of municipalities have this ability to notify you um, because this is something that uh, one way that we can really conserve water is by making sure that we are stopping those leaks when they happen. So be sure to check into that. Ruth, do you use the same system Eye on Water? Yes, that's our Badger meters, and I'm sure you have the same thing, but that, what I was talking about signing people up for WaterSmart, we use the WaterSmart portal, so they get the information from Badger and put it in there. It's a little more user-friendly. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that we know there's a problem, what can we do about it? I really like this, this water sense graphic about how easy it is for us to use or waste water and not even know how much we're wasting because we don't see all of those gallons ticking away when we just have our faucet running and the water is going into the stream, the street and into the curb. So um, one, one thing that we can all do is purchase water sense products. The city of Greeley has a number of rebates um, that you can use to switch out, like Ruth was saying, the shower heads and a number of other ways that if you switch to water sense products that save water, um, then you can get rebates for that. These are products that are certified through a third party and they have these water efficiency standards. And these can be anything from toilets to shower heads, to faucets, to irrigation controllers. And the Water Sense products is a link that you can look at and go to their page afterwards. Um, just like the city of Greeley, other municipalities offer a variety of water conservation resources. A number of them offer free outdoor irrigation audits. This is a way that you can use less water on your lawns um, by making sure that those lawns are efficient or those sprinklers are efficient. Irrigation equipment rebates, um, discounts on resource central garden in a box, like Ruth mentioned, they partner with a number of municipalities in Colorado. So be sure to check their website to see if you qualify and there's discounts, um, maybe potentially up to $25 per box or even more. There's lawn removal services that you could utilize, grants for switching to Xeriscape or removing turf, and then um, and different rebates that you have listed here. So. If you're looking to do to make some changes, um, you should definitely save money in the process. And these are a lot of great ways um, to save money. Okay, so I'd like to switch here to um, how we look at water and, and how we need to redefine the way that we view rain. This image is from the Rainwater Harvesting for the Drylands and Beyond by Brad Lancaster. That's a book that I highly recommend and I'm including it in the additional resources at the end. So if you see here the graphic on the left, this is a traditional home. If you drive around your neighborhood, you'll see that homes are built up kind of like on a hill or a slope and that, that all of the landscaping around it is sloped towards the street. Um, this was done for a good reason. You know, you don't want to have water sitting against your foundation that leads to issues. Um, but what that kind of sloping of the ground also does, especially here in Colorado where we have rainstorms that are quick and usually pretty hard rain, is that all of the water runs immediately off of your landscape into the, into the street. 
And as it runs across your, um, your, your landscapes, it picks up dirt and debris and trash, and then it puts it into our driveways and our streets where it picks up oils and other sorts of debris, and then it deposits it into our waterways. Um, so this is a way that's really taking away nutrients from our lawns and then washing it away. This is viewing rain as a nuisance um, something that even like fear, you know, if you're a gardener, then you yeah. might be concerned about having um, hail on your garden and rushing home whenever there's uh, one of our hail storms in the summer that accompanies our rainstorms. The other way to view the rain is by really looking at the rain as a resource. So how can we keep water on our landscapes longer? How can we utilize the rain to water some gardens, like, like Ruth was talking about with rain gardens, which I'll talk about here in a moment. How can we collect the water, like in rain barrels? And so viewing that rain as a resource, be a happy corgi, be excited when it rains. Um, my, I have two young sons, and of course I've taught them all about rainwater harvesting. And so whenever it rains, they're so excited and they're like, mama, it's raining for your plants. So I wish that for all of you. And it's a different way to look at rain. Rainwater harvesting is the collecting, storing, and putting rainwater runoff to use at your house. It's easy to collect using your existing gutter system. So looking here at this house, um, you can see from the arrows that there are these roof lines that are connected by these gutters and downspouts. And all of the water is going to one, one um, downspout on one side of the house. And so I can guarantee you that they are having issues right there with either water pooling, maybe mosquito issues. It might be impacting their foundation because all of that water is going to one spot. Um, and so that would be a perfect spot for a rain barrel or a rain garden. Why should we be doing rainwater harvesting? Well, it's free. Um, we reduce the demand for treated municipal drinking water. We are using rain and plants love the rain um, for, to, for outdoor irrigation. So we're not using treated drinking water for outdoor irrigation, we're using the rain. And it also helps save money on water bills. One of the questions that I get a lot is, well, that sounds great to do rainwater harvesting, but we don't get that much rain. So how can we even do that in Colorado? So I wanted to share how much rain we get in Greeley and we get 14.69 inches per year. That doesn't sound like that much rain, but one inch of rain on a 1000 square foot roof is approximately 623 gallons, which is plenty of rain to fill up a rain barrel. And so you're looking at having over 7,000 gallons of water per year on that 1,000 square foot roof, which is usually a section of roof even. So there is a lot of opportunity to be able to collect rain and, and use it to our benefit. You can water a number of things with your rain barrel, uh, your food production gardens, pots, greenhouse plants, and then using it to establish native gardens um, and rain gardens as well. There are two types of rainwater harvesting systems, a passive system and an active system. Passive systems um, are like rain gardens. They use gravity to direct and slow the flow of water, and this allows for greater infiltration. Active systems are when you collect and store water for future use, like rain barrels. So very briefly, a rain garden is a garden watered by the rain, very simply. It has a basin, let me get my pointer. It has a basin here and then a berm here, which is a buildup of soil. You're not creating a pond. You're just creating this depression so that the water has to slow down and has time to infiltrate. You then plant it with native plants, which are adapted to our climate and are used to those periods of, of rain and then dryness. And then mulch. Mulch is this super absorbent sponge that protects from protects against weeds and also keeps those plants like acts as like that moisture, that added moisture in the soil. It also breaks down and builds up the soil as well. When you're thinking about using water or looking at water differently, um, look at your problem areas. You know, this is the is my driveway, 
And I had all of this water at my driveway before I did our landscape conversion in the front yard. And as you can see from the top here, the top arrow is showing the slope of my property. And so all of the water was going to this bottom area where my driveway is. That is not where I wanted the water to go. Once you're at the bottom of your mini watershed, it's very difficult to get the water back up. So you want to make changes at the top of your watershed or collect it from your house so that you don't end up with a pool of water at the bottom. So do you have any drainage issues? You know, look at how you can re make changes to your landscape to utilize this in a different way. I know it's difficult to know kind of what a rain garden looks like. So I wanted to share just a small transition that I did at my house to give you a better idea. Before here in the top left, I had seven rose bushes planted here and I had weed barrier and rock. As you can see, that was not very attractive. I had grass growing all up in my uh, weed barrier and it was just a mess. So I decided to instead plant 45 native plants in that area and convert it to a rain garden. Because we had this, um, this is our chicken coop and it's right here, there was not a gutter on our chicken coop. And what was happening is all of the water was running right into the chicken house and causing this, um, you know, kind of wet, damp environment for the chickens that wasn't healthy for them. So we wanted that was a problem. And we wanted to change that to create a beneficial use for that water. So this was planting day, the next um, picture over. And then you can see how it's planted there. And some of you might be thinking, whoa, that is a lot of mulch. No way I'm doing that, way too much mulch. Um, but as you can see, it grew up very quickly. All of the native plants, these pictures are all from the first year that I planted them, several months apart. And so that fills in and now you can't hardly see the mulch at all. And then I also included two of my favorite native plants um, in case you're interested. So I'll pause here. If you have a question, you can unmute yourself or put it in the chat and, um, and feel free to, to put those in either, either way, unmute or put it in the chat and we'll address your questions. I have one if no one else does. Go ahead. So it looks like you did add a gutter and a drain pipe. I did. To the chicken coop. Okay. Yes, um, I can see right here, right here is that gutter and downspout off the chicken coop. And what's at the bottom of the gutter? Like, does it wash away your mulch? A oh, great question. Um, so what you need to add there is some rock so that it doesn't create a um, erosion right there or like a hole from the force okay. of the water coming out of there. So I always add cobbles right there to distribute that water and prevent that from happening. Great, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, if you have questions or think of another one, you can interrupt me or put that in the chat. So Colorado rain barrel regulations. In 2016, rainwater harvesting was legalized for the very first time in Colorado. Before that, it was illegal. We are one of two states that has any restrictions on rainwater harvesting. So it was a really great day in 2016 um, when they allowed rainwater harvesting. But there are still some restrictions. You can have a maximum of two rain barrels with a combined storage capacity of 110 gallons or less. So you can't have three rain barrels all within 40 gallons. That's even though that's less than 110 gallons, it's still more than the two rain barrel limit. You have to use it for outdoor purposes only, like watering lawns or plants or gardens. You can't use it for any indoor uses. Uh, it also has to have a sealable lid. This is to prevent mosquito breeding. We don't wanna have this container of water next to our house with lots of mosquitoes. So be sure it has that sealable lid. Never drink or cook with water from a rain barrel because it's not treated. And you also don't want to give this to your pets or farm animals. I had someone who was interested in putting a rain barrel to feed their chickens. And I had to let them know that that might cause the, the chickens harm because that, th that water is collecting contaminants off of whatever roof it's attached to. And it 
it might lead to illnesses within, within the animals. Some considerations for your rain barrels. There are a lot of different sizes of rain barrels, tons. You can get a um, 100 gallon rain barrel, you can get a 40 gallon rain barrel. Um, really, really big rain barrels are actually called cisterns. Um, they have them in different parts of the country. I worked with cisterns in Arizona. Um, homeowners association. So I guess what I wanted to say on the rain barrel sizes is don't assume there's just one standard size. We recommend using 55 rain, um, gallon rain barrels because then you can get two and you can maximize that 110 limit. Homeowners associations. So check with your HOA before you purchase your rain barrel because they might have restrictions on what color it is or where you can put it. Maybe it has to be in your backyard. Um, instead of your front yard, or maybe it has to be the same color as your house, or maybe it has to be behind a fence. Um, they might have those regulations, but know that HOAs cannot prevent you from getting a rain barrel. That was specifically written into the law that HOAs could not um, forbid you from getting one. So if your HOA is causing some difficulties about installing a rain barrel, um, you have resources, you can contact me and I'm happy to send you resources on where it is in the law that they cannot prevent that. Winterization is needed just like your sprinkler system. So when you do your sprinkler system winterization in like October, that's when you should winterize your rain barrel as well. And then something to keep in mind is where you place your spigot, which is where the water comes out, which is right here right here, and then overflow planning. So there are different types of rain barrels. I'll be going into that momentarily, actually the next slide, but some rain barrels um, will have the option to have the overflow or, you know, it's, it's what happens when your water, when the rain bar barrel fills all the way up and then more rain comes, you know, so there's no room for water. And so the extra water has to go somewhere else. That's called the overflow. So where does that water go? Does it go down your existing downspout? Does it come out of, you know, a spigot, an additional spigot? Sometimes they're like over here, you know, where is that being directed? I've seen installations where their overflow goes right against their foundation, which is not good and not where it should go. So we don't want you to install a rain barrel and then it causes you other problems. So that's something just to think about in your planning. Okay, here are some different types of rain barrels that I have seen. Um, one that I have seen that's very popular is this one on the far left. It looks, it's terracotta. Um, and it has this hole or this depression at the very top where that arrow is. And that is for a planter, you know, where you can put other flowers. The problem with that one is that if you don't have plants in there, then it's just this small depression and mosquitoes tend to breed in very shallow water. So you're creating this mosquito breeding area um, and we don't want that to happen. So that's something to be careful of. Additionally, the spigot height, and I can see that my arrows are a little bit off, <laughs> but the spigot height here is really high. That's something else to consider when purchasing a rain barrel. So anything below your spigot is water that you will not be able to access because it's not coming out of your spigot. It's below the spigot line. So you're really reducing the amount of water that you can use by having a very high spigot. So keep that in mind. The next one is a screen. So you can see here that there's a screen on the top. Um, it's a different type of rain barrel. And the problem with this one is that sunlight can get into your barrel. When sunlight gets into barrels, it creates algae. So you're essentially setting up a system that you will have constant algae in your rain barrel. Additionally, those holes, I'm, I'm imagining that the holes on this screen are not small enough to keep out insects. So you could potentially have mosquitoes in your rain barrel in that situation. The next one, um, the middle one, it's also a screen. I mean, I can see the holes from here. They are definitely not small enough to keep out insects. So that would be problematic. Next is, um, and is illegal. <laughs> so you need to have a sealable lid. So you might be thinking, well, I can go out and take that lid and close it, you know, and then it's sealed and you would be right. But I don't know how many of you want to run outside and open up your rain barrel when it's raining and then run outside and close it as soon as it stops raining and then run back out when the storm comes back, you know, so it's not very practical. Um, and it's really just the pain. So we want to have systems that are easy to maintain and easy to use. 
Next is winterization concerns. So the next one that looks orange, that rain barrel, as you can see, the downspout is connected immediately into the top of the rain barrel. And the concern that I have for this one is that I don't see anything that some sort of filter on, on this system capturing all of like the leaves or materials that are on top of your roof. And so what's happening is all of that material is going into your barrel and forming a sediment or kind of sludge at the bottom of your barrel, which means you'll have to clean it out more. You're also reducing the total amount of water that you can keep in that barrel because there's that like sediment layer. And then you might even reach a situation where it clogs up where you can get your water out of or your spigot. Um, additionally, this is going to cause problems for winterization. So since you have cut off your downspout higher than the bottom of your um, house foundation and you can't leave rain barrels in place for the winter because they will freeze in this type of system, then um, you'll have to remove that rain barrel and then you'll have a shortened um, downspout and then all of that water will just, the freezing water will go right down to your foundation. That's another issue. And finally, I recently saw these types of rain barrels that look like boxes and they're cool because they have these different configurations and you know you can put them in different places and make them look you know different and that seems like a really great idea. The only problem with this is you're thinking well how do you keep water in there you know because there's holes in this blocks. And it looks kind of like play mats if any of you have children we had these play mats you could put together. So this just has a really big plastic bag inside, which is extremely difficult to clean. So I would want to save you all the aggravation of having to clean out a really big plastic bag um, by suggesting different type of um, a rain barrel. So what type of rain barrel do I recommend? And that is with a diverter. So this connects directly to your downspout right here right here, you don't cut your downspout, you just drill into it, you connect it, the overflow goes directly down this downspout that was already existing. It's a very simple install. And then for winterization, all you do is remove the diverter and put on a winterization cap and I will be going through that. Where to buy them? Um, there are multiple different places that you can buy them. If you are in the Northern Colorado area, there's an organization called Colorado Rain Catcher. And this is a code if you would like to buy from them. There's, um, you can utilize this code and get $5 off. Um, or there's Blue Barrel, which is a nationwide company. They work with local suppliers so that you would um, contact them and purchase your barrel and then go pick it up locally. Container Reclaimer is another great place to get barrels only with Colorado Raincatcher and Blue Barrel. You can get the barrel and the connection kits, um, but Container Reclaimer only has the barrels and they are cheaper, but be just be aware that you will need to clean them out because they're upcycled barrels that have different things in them. I have purchased from there and one time I had soy sauce and like 55 gallons is a lot of soy sauce <laughs> um, or there was like like lime in it one time. Um, so they can have different things in them. And sometimes they rinse them out, but sometimes they don't. You can also purchase from your major box stores, um, but beware of Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. So I tried, I was organizing a large rain barrel pickup one time and there was a Facebook, um, someone on Facebook selling rain barrels and I needed 50 and they had 50 and it sounded perfect. So I asked them what was inside of it. And they said it was food grade soap, which would work out great. But I got there and actually the barrels had hydrochloric acid in them. So you don't want to buy barrels that had any sort of chemical in them. You want to buy food grade barrels because if it has chemicals, then they leach into the plastic. And the standard procedure is to rinse out the barrels three times. But even that procedure, you still have that you know, contaminant that's leached into the plastic. And then as you have your rain barrel fill up with water and that water sits in that barrel, those contaminants leach back into your, into your rain barrel and then you put our rainwater and then you put that on your plants. And so it's just not good. So just be sure that you know that they're food grade barrels. Jessica? Yes. Um, in Greeley, um, I have seen the blue barrels at the ReStore yeah. for Habitat for Humanity and they have 
hot sauce in them. I mean, had hot sauce in them. So you do have to clean them out. Sure. I thought they were only 10 or $20. So that's great. Thank yeah. you for that um, information. And there's also, if you're not in Greeley, and you said it was Restore? The Restore um, for restore. Habitat for Humanity. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, there's another Restore in the Boulder area. And I believe that sometimes you can get lucky and have those um, there as well. Um, so thank you for that suggestion. That's another great place to get them. And so here's generally how much it might cost um, if you get a new barrel um, that doesn't need to be cleaned out at Colorado Raincatcher, for example, they're about $40. Container Reclaimer has it for $20. You know, if you're going to restore, it could be cheaper. Um, the rain barrel adapter parts, the cheapest kit that I've seen is for, with Colorado Raincatcher, and that's $30. Um, and then you'll need a way to get the water out of the barrel. So you can use a watering can, you can use a hose, but that could potentially be another expense. So your total, and I'm talking about DIY or do-it-yourself rain barrels here. So this is kind of the most cost-effective way to do rain barrels. There are plenty of opportunities if you want to get a really fancy rain barrel to spend way more than this. So when I mentioned that the kits, the cheapest kit that I found with Colorado Raincatcher has is $30, you might be able to find other kits that are cheaper, but something to just really note is they might not have all the pieces that you need. So I have seen ones that don't have whole bits or whole saws, which I'll be talking about, or a spigot, which is where you get your water out. So they might look like a good deal, but if you don't have all the components you need, then it's just going to be frustrating for you to try to match up what size whole saw you need with the part, the additional parts. Um, so the materials, you'll definitely need a rain barrel. Um, and you can read this list um, of other items that you'll need. I do want to say kind of the last one, a wrench. I use that one because, and I'll show you at the end how I utilize that. It's just to really get the whole saw on there tightly. One of the questions that I get too is um, how, can I use a metal barrel? Because some people have metal barrels sitting around and they just want to upcycle it, which I am all about upcycling. And so they asked me that question. And so you can use um, metal barrels for your rain barrel, but what you have to do is you have to go to the store and get this plastic paint to coat the inside and outside of your metal barrel so that it doesn't rust like the picture here. And then you don't have water leaking out. By the time you do all of that, it would have been cheaper and easier just to get a plastic barrel. So I recommend plastic ones. You can use other, you know, many different kinds, but kind of in this DIY space, there's mainly two different kinds. One is with these um, screw caps, and then one is a fully opening lid. This one fully opens. The ones that open completely tend to be more expensive. Um, and then the, the screw caps you see are the usually cheaper ones, um, but both of them work great. The only thing is that the ones that open all the way are slightly easier to clean. And if you do get those upcycled barrels, just know that you may need additional cleaning, like I mentioned. Okay, so in talking about the type of diverter, you know, this type of diverter has different names. It looks like this. Again, I'll be doing that show and tell at the end, but this is the diverter. It's sometimes called the earth-minded diverter. The Colorado Raincatcher uses the same one. Um, and so it has different names, but the pros of it are, it's easy to install. You don't have to remove your downspout and cost effective, and then the kit comes with the whole saw and spigot. The cons are that you are unable to see the clogs because this part of the diverter is in your gutter or your downspout. And it has the potential for clogging because it has this small interior opening and larger materials could get caught in there like leaves or pine needles potentially. But all you need to do, it's not that difficult. You just remove your, um, your diverter from your downspout and then clear out the clog and then reinsert it. But those are the potential clogs. Okay, if there aren't any questions, um, I'm going to go ahead and get into how to install your rain barrel. The first thing that you need to do is to walk around your home and look at all of your downspout locations. I was surprised to find that at my house, we have five downspouts. So these are all of the potential locations for your rain barrel. 
you want to choose a location based on the proximity to where you need the water. So if you have a garden that's in the front of your house, but you're, you think the perfect spot for your rain barrels in the back of your house, you just wanna think about that because think of how many trips you'll be doing from the back of your house to the front. And if you're trying to increase your step count, that might be great. But if you are looking to do something, you know, that's really easy in the mornings when you need to water um, your plants, then that might not be the best place. The next thing you want to look at is the ease of making a level base in that area. So the base is where you put your rain barrel on top of, and it has to be level. So how easy is it to make a level base? I have seen people that want to put their, um, their rain barrels on, on a slope and it's possible, it's just more challenging to make that area flat. And then finally the catchment area. And this is the amount of water you can collect from that downspout or roof line. And here is how you look at your catchment area. So you Google your address and then switch to satellite view and then zoom into your house rooftop. And one easy way that I have seen to, to really be able to help determine this um, is by looking at this top down view. So when I was looking to install my rain barrel, I originally thought that I wanted to put it at the number one because it was really close to the garden I wanted to have in the front yard and that sort of a thing. But then when I did the satellite view, I noticed that it was a very small roof line. So then I decided to look at where the number two location was, which was still close to where I wanted to uh, my garden and everything in the front yard, but it had a much larger roof line. So I knew that at pretty much every rain, my rain barrel would be full. So that's an easy way to help you look at what are some better spots to put your rain barrel potentially. The other thing is you don't have to just use your house roof. You could use other roof lines as well. And so um, right here, I use my loafing shed to put my rain barrel. And I have this very long arrow here just to show you that it is like a pretty large distance between my rain barrel and my garden, but it's uphill of my garden. And I, I am continually amazed by what water can do. I don't know why I'm so like, astounded by this, but when I hook up my hose to my, rain, to my rain barrel and take it all the way to my garden and water comes out, it's exciting every single time. Maybe that's just me, but it's just something that's really neat. You wanna use gravity to your advantage and you can even go longer distances um, away from your rain barrel and, and utilize those different um, rooftops to your advantage. Okay, so creating a base. Full rain barrels are extremely heavy. Children must be supervised around them. Just wanna put that out there. They can weigh over 500 pounds. So that is why you want to be sure that your base is level and it will not tip. Additionally, another reason why you want to have a base is because it, it enables you to put something underneath the, the spigot. So there at the arrow is the spigot and you can see that it's so close to the ground, it would be impossible to put a, a bucket or a, a watering can underneath that spigot. So, one of the reasons why you want to elevate it or create that base is so it's easier to get access to that spigot and put that bucket or that, um, that hose, whatever you're going to use to get water out of the rain barrel, um, have access to that spigot. Additionally, when you turn on your water, um, your faucets on your house, they all have water pressure. Um, Rainwater does not have water pressure. So you elevate the, the rain barrel to create water pressure. So when your rain barrel is full, you'll have more water pressure. As it empties, you will have less. So that's just something to note. Um, as you see those big water towers everywhere, they're always really high um, or tall because they need to create that water pressure. Um, so when you're doing your base, you want to put your base within three feet of your downspout. And that is because that is the, the, the width of these connector pieces. So I'll be talking a little bit more about that, um, but my recommendation is to connect it as close as possible. Don't try to stretch it the three feet, connect it as close as possible. Put your base and your rain barrel as close as you can to your downspout. 
You can get a commercially available rain barrel stand. The only one I really advise against is one that looks like a stool. It has like three legs on it. And that is because if you use that on like a, a soil or something that isn't concrete, um, then it has a tendency, you know, to, to tip as your, as your soil settles or as it rains, and then everything can just become, um, you know, unstable and tip over and then it can, you know, cause a lot of issues. So my favorite, even though they aren't, you know, I guess the most attractive, um, but I love cinder blocks because they're all the same size. They are readily available. Um, they are not expensive. They're in fact, very cheap. I think it's like 79 cents for a cinder block. And I have found out that six cinder blocks are what you need for a 55 gallon rain barrel. But in this picture to the right, you can see that they use like some pavers. And so using materials that you have in your house works great too. Um, but if you're looking for something new, you can use wood, you can use bricks. Um, the only thing I advise kind of with bricks is making sure that they're flat, that they're not bumpy, because you want to be sure that your base is, uh, is very stable. Okay, next, um, drill a spigot hole in your barrel. And I can't see any of your faces, but yes, that's me. And this was my first rain barrel that I was drilling a hole into. And I was very concerned that I was going to mess it up. And so I didn't mess it up. And I just want you to say that, you know, you, I'm not what you would call handy. So if I can do it, you can do it. I promise. These are all the steps you need to do your rain barrel. And I believe in you. Um, what you want to do when you're drilling in your spigot hole is or drilling into your barrel at all is you want to sit on your barrel it gives you greater control and it doesn't move around on you for your spigot you want to measure three inches from the bottom of your barrel and make a mark and then carefully drill the spigot hole centered on the mark using the smallest hole saw smallest hole saw what i'm going through with this section is the kit that i'll be showing to you later and it's the kit from colorado rain catcher um, but if you use a different kit, then you need to follow those instructions, obviously. Um, so the reason why I keep emphasizing the smallest hole saw is because there's different sizes of hole saws. So as you can see, there's different sizes here. And so you want to be sure to use the correct hole saw with the correct size gasket. Next is you want to insert the smallest gasket. It looks like a raindrop. Um, I really like that it looks like a raindrop, but I'm also... Um, a water nerd. But anyway, I have been asked in the past if, you know, if it's important which direction the raindrop is pointing. And it's not important. I just like for it to be up because it looks like a raindrop versus, you know, having it be down. So it really doesn't matter. Um, you want to insert your gasket as soon as you finish drilling it. This one is a little bit more difficult to get in to the barrel. And so when you, right when you finish drilling it, the plastic is warm. And so you want to go ahead and insert your, your gasket, have it ready when you start drilling um, and insert it into the hole. Since this one is kind of tricky to get in, not tricky, just a little bit difficult to get in, you can put soap around the outside of your gasket, the part that will be going into your barrel and it makes it easier to get in. Once you insert your gasket, then you can screw on your spigot. Don't screw on your spigot first because then you won't be able to get your gasket into your rain barrel. So once the gasket's installed, then you can screw on your spigot and then make sure that your spigot is closed. And I'm sure all of you are thinking, um, that's really obvious, Jessica. Is that really needing a bullet point? <laughs> but yes, it is because um, I've made all the mistakes so that you don't have to make them. I was really excited about installing this rain barrel at my house. I was taking all these pictures um, for the classes that I teach and I had just, it was going to rain. So I was in a hurry. I wanted to capture that rain. And I took this picture to say, okay, I need to remind my students to have it closed. And then I, for some reason, opened it. So then I went inside, I was watching the rain. I went back inside ecstatic to see how much rain I collected. And I collected none because the spigot was open. So these are, this is what's called a full port hose bib. So this is different. <laughs> thank you, Jolene. Think this is different than the kind of spigot you see on your house, which looks like a wheel usually, and you twist it and twist it. And those are very small openings. 
And it doesn't matter because your, um, your water on your house has pressure, has water pressure. But since rain barrels don't have water pressure, I recommend these full port hose bibs because they have a very full opening. It's a, it's a large opening and that way the water will come out faster. I saw a demonstration um, comparing a full port hose bib to one of those regular like turn um, spigots and the full port hose bib filled up the five gallon bucket in less than 30 seconds. And I think it was 15 seconds actually. And the, the other type of spigot filled it up in a minute and a half. So I want to save you all the aggravation and just tell you which one is easier to use and will get your bucket filled up faster. Next, you need to drill the intake hole or the fill hole where the water will come into your barrel. You need to consider where you're going to put your barrel before, before you drill the fill hole. Because again, this tubing is only three feet long and you want to have the intake hole or the fill hole the same side as, the, as where your downspout is, okay? Closest to your downspout. Then you want to do the same thing, measure three inches from the top of your barrel, make a mark, assemble the medium size hole saw, and then drill in your fill hole centered on the mark and insert the medium rubber fitting. So the medium fitting is easier to get in, but if it's tricky at all, you can um, put a little soap on the outside of that as well and insert it um, in that way. And you might remember me talking about how you want to have your spigot um, low to the ground and that's the same thing. So here three inches and from the bottom and three inches from the top so you can really maximize the amount of water you're getting in your rain barrel. Okay next we're talking about the diverter installation. So you want to place oh you want to place sorry about that I don't see how I made all of those marks on my screen. Anyway um, so when you are placing your barrel for the diverter you want to um, be sure to line up your rain barrel so the spigot is facing out. Um, and so you can see the arrow that I have here that the spigot is facing out. And that is so that you can reach your spigot. So if you go in and you're excited to install your rain barrel, but your spigot is facing a direction that's very difficult to get at your spigot, that's going to be um, annoying for you. So just be sure that it's facing the direction that you want it to when you're about to install your diverter. Um, next, measure your downspout. So you always want to drill on the three inch side of your downspout. Your downspout could be two by three or three by four. Most commercial or most residential houses are two by three, but, and commercial is more three by four, but I actually have a three by four downspout on my house. So you just need to measure to be sure because the downspout, or sorry, the diverter that you receive in your kit has to go on the three inch side. Um, next, you need to use a level to mark the downspout at the height of the intake hole. So you need that to be level. The fill tube, the intake tube, must be level with the intake hole to allow any extra water to flow back into the downspout. So if you have inserted your diverter up here, and this is where your hole is um, to go into the barrel, then the water will go into your barrel and it'll fill it just fine. But since water cannot go uphill, then your water will not go out your downspout like it's supposed to. It'll come out the top of your barrel. Ask me how I know that. I definitely did that and it was a big mess. And then it's difficult to change. So you need to have that level. If you install your barrel too low or your, your downspout too low, your barrel will never fill with water because water doesn't go uphill, okay? So get that level out, measure twice, cut once as, I, as I've heard. And then um, this one is a little bit more difficult because you are going through metal. Um, you're not cutting through plastic. So be sure to wear eye protection and gloves when you're drilling through metal. You need to be sure that you are putting pressure equally when you're drilling this in just because you might, you know, start kind of turning to the side and then you'll have one side cut and the other side won't be cutting as equally. Um, <clears throat> using the largest hole saw, you need to make that cut. 
on the three inch side of the barrel and holding that straight. And then you will get this little disc, um, as you can see here, that comes out of your downspout. Um, the thing to just think about with this is whether check whether or not you can see the bottom of your downspout. I have seen some downspouts that go into the ground and you definitely don't want this little disc to be caught in the ground because that will cause problems. You, water won't be able to flow through appropriately. So be sure that you catch that little disc if you have a downspout that um, goes underground or you can disconnect your downspout from going underground before you do the drilling to be sure that disc doesn't go um, inside the underground area. Next, insert your downspout. So this is called the FlexiFit diverter. You squeeze the size of the rubber diverter like so. The cup and arrow should be facing up as pictured here. And then you just kind of, just kind of like wiggle it into the hole. Um, and then you need to have, you have these two little screws that you screw in and these are called self-tapping screws. So if you're not familiar with self-tapping screws, the way that these work is different from the screws that you would use in wood. So in screws in like wood, for example, when you can't go any farther or where you know that that screw is set, it stops. You can't, you know, you can't screw it in any longer. But that is not what happens with self-tapping screws into metal. So what you need to do with this, they, it won't ever stop. It's just not the way it's designed because it has that gap space in, behind it in a gutter or a downspout rather. And so you need to just watch the metal. And when you see the metal pop up, there's usually a gap when you start um, screwing in that screw. Um, but then when the screw is completely um, in, it, the metal pops back up to your diverter. So just look for that. I know it sounds kind of weird right now, but you, you'll understand when you're um, installing this. Also with this diverter, <clears throat> there is this little ridge. I know it's very difficult to see. There's a little ridge right here. And so when you first install it, you think it's flush, but you actually need to give it one more push so that you can hear this pop to know that it's actually fully installed. And then you can put in the self-tapping screws. Okay, so since you can have two rain barrels, you can install them in different places or multiple locations, or you can put them together if you have a larger uh, rain barrel or a downspout right there, or if you just have this really great spot where you need more water. So there are these connector kits that are available. Um, Colorado Raincatcher has them, so does Blue Barrel. And what you need for a connector kit is an extra um, connection tube, and then you need two of these medium gaskets. Um, two additional ones to connect those barrels. And then you need, of course, the spigot, another spigot and another gasket for the spigot. So um, what you need to do to install the, uh, the second barrel is you need to make sure that that connection um, piping or the tubing is below your first intake hole on barrel one. And the reason for that, because you'll install it the same way that you do the intake hole for your first barrel or the one the way that we've already gone over, but you wanna put the second intake hole lower so that that barrel, the second barrel will fill up before the first barrel starts sending water down your downspout. So it has to be lower. Just remember that's really important. And it needs to be level for the same reason as the first barrel. Something I just wanted to note in this bottom picture is that this was an example of an installation that had the full extension of the three feet. And what I found with that, and I'll just do my show and tell now for that. So here you have everything level, you think it looks great. And then you realize that this happens. So I was holding it flat this way, and then it looks like a smiley face. And we've already learned that water does not go uphill and actually it'll sit in the middle of this, of this tubing. And so what was happening is in this case, the rain barrels were not filling up. So I had to have something that was propping up this tubing to allow for it to remain flat. So in order for, um, th so this piping is, is firmer, the smaller it is. And that's why I recommend having your rain barrel as close to your downspout as possible so that you don't have that, um, that lack of stability and it doesn't flex on you. 
So after you install your rain barrels, then you need to test your system. And the way that I do that is just by putting a um, putting your hose on your sprinkler, um, or not your sprinkler, just putting a hose and spraying the roof line above where you installed your rain barrel. And then you'll be able to either see the water coming into your barrel, if you have a barrel that has a fully liftable top, or if you have the screw cap kind of tops, you can hear it. So you just wanna make sure that there aren't any um, gaps that you installed it correctly and know that if there's any issues, you can see it happening instead of when you have, uh, when it's raining and you don't wanna go outside and, and check to make sure that everything's going okay. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna take a pause and ask for any questions on the installation before I go into winterizing. Are there any questions on that? I'm not seeing any in the chat. Okay. And as you all know, you're welcome to put those in the chat or um, unmute and ask them. Okay. I have one. Yes. Um, with the barrels that you've talked about, the blue um, food grade barrels that um, that you talked about earlier, do they have a removable lid? What is the lid situation on those? Yeah, so it so the barrels can be blue and have a removable lid or have the um, the screw off caps. It just kind of depends. The, the ones that lift off the fully removable lids tend to be more expensive. So if you're going the really economical route, the barrel that you'll probably have is the type with the two, um, the two screw caps. And so, so Jamie, did you have a question on how to like clean those or what that looked like potentially? Yeah, I guess I, I was wondering if, you know, as um, leaves and debris go in, you know, what, what the upkeep is and how that works. Sure. Um, so actually, I'll be going into maintenance here in a moment, but the way that you maintain the ones that have the, the screw caps on them is you empty out all of the water with, um, through the spigot. And then you can just stick a hose in one of the screw caps and rinse out all of the debris and then open up the other screw cap and the larger debris will come out that way. And I actually later on um, in a few slides, I will give you a recipe for cleaning out your, your barrel and putting it away for the winter. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great. Okay, so can I, winter- Can I add something? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have several of the barrels both open in the, uh, what they call the bung, uh, in the bung, if you get a bung wrench, yeah, that's really easy to open those uh, hole the bungs on the closed top uh, barrels. We bought several of those from Pepsi Company in Denver years ago for ten dollars. So, <laughs> but you can't get them anymore. But the other question I have is yeah. when you put in the spigots and the intake. Uh, you don't need to reach inside the barrel and put a, a lock nut on there, right? You, you just don't. screw it into the gasket. That's that's correct. So okay. there are, I have seen, um, and I have used myself the other kind that you have to screw in. And that's not the way that they're designed anymore. So the way they're designed is they, they just have this like ridge on them. And so it stays in there without having to put a nut on the back. So all you have to do, and it makes it easier to install and, um, and, to, and to use, honestly, but just inserting this and you don't have to then worry about the nut falling off and the whole thing falling out. Um, have you had that happen to you? Have you utilized that other kind before? Yes, I have, but it's, uh, it's a pain. It is a pain. <laughs> so <laughs> I was really glad when, when this type came out so it makes it easier for everyone. And I'm really glad that you mentioned that tool. So the, the screw off caps or the bungs as, as Chuck mentioned, that is what they're called. Um, sometimes it can be really tight on there. And so getting kind of that wrench that's special for that type of screw cap can help you get those off. So if it's not coming off and you're thinking, oh, maybe these aren't supposed to come off, they are, they're just sometimes stuck. Um, thank you for that, Chuck. Okay, so you wanna empty the barrel, you want to remove the tubing. So you have the tubing connected to your diverter. So you want to remove that tubing, remove the diverter, 
and then place on your winterization cap, which looks like this, and it's flat. And you want to keep those same two screws and just put on your winterization cap here. Something that I would definitely like for you to, to note is that sometimes the diverter, the manufacturers will say that you can just turn over your diverter and leave it there for the winter. I don't recommend this because with our um, freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing, what I think will, have, will happen is that ice will get stuck right here and then you'll have issues of your gutters not functioning properly. So I recommend that you just remove it, put on your winterization cap, and call it good, it's, it is easy to do. Then you want to check your winterization cap for leaking. Just like the diverter, it has this little lip on it. You want to make sure that it's fully installed by giving it that extra push and then um, inserting the, the screws as well. You can leave the barrel in place or store it for the winter. So it really depends on the situation that you have. If you have a very like windy area where the barrels, they're really light when they're not full of water. And so if your barrel is going to be blown away, then putting it in your garage or your shed or something uh, would probably work better. But if you don't have that issue, you can definitely leave them in place. Uh, maintenance wise, okay, so with the larger, I, I mentioned earlier that really big rain barrels are called cisterns. So in these cistern systems, what they utilize is something called a first flush. And it is PVC pipe and it's connected to the cistern and that fills with water, like dirty water um, from when the rain hits like a, a roof right after um, the first rain of spring, you know, all of that contaminants are collected. It could be ash like from our fires or leaves or whatever it is. And so that, um, that PVC pipe will collect all of that dirty water and then cleaner water will go into the cistern. And that's called the first flush. So that doesn't make sense to do for a 55 gallon rain barrel, but the way that you can mimic that same strategy is by waiting to connect your barrel until after the first rain of spring. That way all of like the, the contaminants and materials can wash off your roof, go down your downspout and just out into your yard and then connect your rain barrel and get that cleaner water. I know it can be hard because we're all really excited for that first rain and want to you know, connect our rain barrel up right away, but I promise it's worth the wait. And it's uh, less maintenance for you later on. Also clean out your gutters before that first rain or before connecting your barrel. Same reason, if you don't clean out your gutters then all of that gunk and material is going to go right into your rain barrel or some of it will because there is this, um, this hole where some of it will go out but some of it will still get into your barrel and then you need to clean it out. Um, rinse out your barrel when you are putting it away for the winter so that you're preventing algae bloom. So, by doing this regular maintenance and keeping your rain barrel clean, it helps to prevent algae blooms because you're removing those contaminants and, and particulates that are, are sitting there. And the longer they sit there, the more likelihood they have of creating those algae blooms. And then this seems really obvious, but use the water in your barrel. The longer the water sits, the more likely you'll have that algae blooms like I was mentioning. Um, but also, you know, you'll have less ability to collect water the next time. So using the water in your barrel ensures that you're cycling that water through and then you have that ability to collect more because the really powerful part of rain barrels is that you're not just collecting 55 gallons, you're collecting 55 gallons and 55 gallons and 55 gallons. Um, some of the frequently asked questions that I get is, will collecting water off an asphalt roof leach pollutants? Yes. Um, there was this study done, and it's actually on the next one, the highlighted one, um, of all the different types of roof materials that can leach contaminants. So there's a lot of different types of roofs, and there will be something that comes off of all of them, generally speaking. But if your concern is about what you're putting that rainwater on, so is it safe to use rainwater on a garden, on like a food production garden? The answer, the short answer is yes. The long answer is that there is this wonderful study that was conducted um, testing all these different roof types and they hyper polluted them. So they put tons of contaminants on there to 
more than we would normally see on our own homes. And then um, they had it, you know, they had it rain and then they tested the water, then they found all the contaminants and then they put the water on their garden and then they tested the vegetables that they took out of the garden. And what they found, and one of the amazing things about soil is that soil filters out pollutants. And so the, the vegetables that were collected did not have the contaminants in them. So you, you can feel confident that using rainwater on your, um, your potatoes even, your carrots, your squash, um, your tomatoes, um, all of those things, you'll be perfectly fine. The one thing that I always like to just note is to use drinking water on your leafy greens because, or things, I guess, leafy greens, um, because you're going to be eating those directly and the water will be in contact with your leafy greens. Um, I would just suggest using your, your drinking water for that one. And then the rest of it, you can use your rainwater. And then when you're watering like your tomatoes, for example, water near the root and don't water, you know, the entire plant. It's best practice anyway to water at the root of the plant, but you know, then you're putting that rainwater on um, the fruit of the tomato, which you would eat. So um, again, it is safe. You just need to take those um, additional precautions. Um, will algae grow in my barrel? It can. Um, and it definitely will if you have those different types of rain barrels that I was kind of cautioning you against with that screen. Additionally, if you are getting upcycled barrels, sometimes they're white. I know that mostly we see the blue barrels, but um, sometimes the food grade barrels are white. And if you have a white barrel, then you definitely have to paint it because if sunlight can enter into your barrel, then you're more likely to get algae. How do I keep leaves and particles out of my barrel? By doing those best maintenance practices, by waiting for the first flush, by cleaning out your gutters, um, and then and then then having this diverter, you know, you'll have the larger particles go through that hole, and so your water will be cleaner. Can mosquitoes still get in my barrel? It could. It is unlikely or less likely because of the diverter system, you know, it's more, it's more of a closed system than having um, water, than when you have the downspout cut and water goes directly into the top of your barrel. I'm not sure if any of you have seen systems like that, um, but having this diverter, it's more of a closed system. And so it's less likely, but in case you wanted to know more about mosquitoes than you ever wanted to know, mosquitoes do breed in very shallow water. So that water, in your gutter after a rain, there's like a little tiny bit of water still left over in your gutter. Mosquitoes can lay eggs in that, and then that can wash into your barrel. And so if you do have that issue, again, this is all unlikely, but if you run into that issue, there's something called a mosquito dunk that you can get, and that link is there. It's harmless to pollinators and wildlife and safe on plants, and it just goes after that mosquito larvae. So that is a very um, safe option, um, natural option to use to get rid of the mosquitoes. Here is that formula, formula for cleaning out your barrel. Um, and so sometimes rain barrels can get kind of gunky, you know, and you can use this to, um, to rinse them out. One of the things you might be wondering, well, if I have those two screw caps, how do I clean them out? How do I like get the material in there and rinse it? So what you do is you put all of these materials, you know, that those formulas into your barrel, you turn it on the side and then you just kind of wiggle it. <laughs> um, and so I tend to roll it several times to kind of swish that water around to clean the entire inside of the barrel. It might take doing this a couple of times and then getting a heavy sprayer and spraying out um, the barrel on the inside. So it is not difficult to do, um, and it is definitely possible with those um, screw cap options as well. Decorating your barrel. Um, if you don't like the blue, or if you get a white barrel and you want to decorate it, here's what you need to do to decorate that. One tip is to decorate your barrel before you install it, because um, sometimes paint does not come off of houses. Also ask me how I know that. <laughs> Um, and how thrilled my husband was when that happened. Um, and so decorate it or remove the barrel from the house before decorating. What you need to do is use sandpaper, um, 100 weight. There's different weights of sandpaper. 
So 100 weight, which is very, and very lightly sand it. And that is to allow the paint primer to kind of stick to that plastic. Then you need to wipe it down after you sand it, allow it to dry. This doesn't take very long at all. Then spray this plastic paint primer. Um, the paint won't stick without it, like I mentioned. It has a 30 minute dry time, so it's pretty quick turnaround. And I like to use the Rust-Oleum two times ultra cover primer for plastic. It takes one and a half cans for a 55 gallon barrel so that you know how much to get. These Rust-Oleum primers um, come in gray or white. It doesn't matter which one you get, it really doesn't. It's just like, for instance, um, they only had the gray in stock when I went um, and got that. So then you spray that down and then you can use your own design um, for your rain barrel. You can use acrylic paint. You can get cardboard stencils or decals. Um, but just know that if you use an, um, if you're using acrylic paint for these artistic barrels, then you need to protect your work by spraying with paint sealer when you're done. Um, and also another trick that if you get the white barrel and put a piece of like painting tape, as you can see in this picture, and make a stripe down the side of the barrel and then paint it. And then you can see the water level in your barrel, which is pretty cool. If you have a blue barrel, then that might not, that, that won't work obviously, because you won't have that clear design in there. Um, but for white barrels, that's something neat that you can do. Jessica, we have yes. a question in the chat. Okay. Um, Chuck asked if the algae is harmful for vegetable gardens. Generally not. Um, and so I would say that the, the algae is actually good. There's a couple of different forms of algae and I'm sure you've all heard or maybe have read about the toxic algae um, that you see sometimes in our lakes in the summertime. That's generally not the kind that, that we get in rain barrels. Um, and so algae, what it's doing is it's just, it's actually um, like eating the pollutants in your rain barrel. And so it's actually good. It's like cleaning that water. Um, and so, so no, it's, it's not harmful to put on your plants. And, and again, that soil will um, uptake any contaminants and it will prevent it from it going into your vegetables. So you don't need to worry. And, and as long as you're not using it on your leafy greens, then um, you're good for all of your other vegetables. I wanted to show, um, is there any other questions, Ruth? Is that the only one? I didn't see any others, so no. Um, one thing I wanted to show you here is if you need inspiration for decorating your barrel, I always go to Pinterest. Um, Pinterest has everything, of course, but I liked uh, some of these designs, so I'm not creative myself. The kind of my speed is that white rain barrel with the handprints, that's really, my level of artistic skill. Um, but there's a lot of really cool designs that you can do for your rain barrels um, and you can get creative. I thought it was really neat, this one on the far left, um, where they utilize the blue color of their barrel as a part of their design. Like that is brilliant. Um, and so what you would do in this case, if you're interested in following this pattern, is you would just spray the paint primer on the areas where like use a stencil and, and spray the primer in the stencil so that you can just color those flowers and keep that, that blue background design. I thought this bottom one where it had, you know, multiple barrels together and continuing the design over multiple barrels was really, really impressive and neat too. So um, here's your inspiration for decorating your rain barrels. Um, some people don't like that blue coloring and there's lots of different options for what you could have that look like. Okay, so you might be wondering like how many times can I actually fill a rain barrel? So in 2020, I filled my rain barrel 11 times. And that was 605 gallons of rainwater used. So this can conserve a lot of water. And if you um, think about how many people, you know, could get these rain barrels and save that much water, then our collective impact would be um, really substantial. Um, this is actually, since this is a rain barrel at my house, I, I use chalkboard paint. I, I sprayed it with primer and then I use chalkboard paint because I have children and then um, it washes off during the rain and then we can design it again. So I actually really like using chalkboard paint. Again, 
the decorating. <laughs> um, this was something very easy for me to do with my children and we liked it. So if you need another idea. Um, so together by utilizing these water conservation strategies, we can save thousands of gallons of water and help build sustainable communities, which will ensure that there is water for our future generations. I created, um, um, so thank you all for your interest in, in this water conservation strategy and rain barrels. This is the type of interest that we need to really make a difference moving forward. So, so thank you all for your attention and interest in doing that. Um, here are some additional resources. So there is this really quick rain barrel installation video if you would like to see um, someone doing an actual installation. But when I say quick, it is 45 seconds long, <laughs> I think. I mean, it's very quick. Um, I don't typically install my rain barrels in 45 seconds, but this is just showing you how easy it is to install your barrel. That did not include building the base. I will just like to say that, but um, it is helpful if you want to see what that looks like in real time. Um, the book that I mentioned, The Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond, if you're interested in learning more about rainwater harvesting, I highly recommend that book. Here is the link to the Colorado Stormwater Center, um, and then those different places that you can buy barrels, um, Resource Central, which um, Ruth mentioned, and then of course the City of Greeley Water Conservation website. So um, I'll open it up for questions. I am going to stop sharing my screen so that I can do kind of my show and tell um, section. And if can you I just like say something real quick? Yes. We did a rain barrel sale, um, discounted rain barrel sale a few years ago, but currently we don't have any to sell. Okay, thank you. So it's possible we'll do that again, but right now don't go to our webpage for that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay. Jessica, another yes. question that I have is, um, for some reason, I've always thought that water falling from the sky needs to go back into the ground to go into the aquifer wherever to be utilized. So does this interfere with that process? I'm I mean, so is glad, that why we're limited? I'm so glad that you brought that up. So originally with the water law, any raindrop that fell from the sky was already owned by someone else. And that was the water rights. And so they really didn't want the collection of water to harm any of um, anyone's water right. But the way that I explain it is that unless you're filling up your rain barrel and then carting it out of the watershed, all of that water is being used on your property and going down into the groundwater. Um, and so something else that I really, it really helped me to understand how important slowing down our water is. So as we have um, urbanized, as we have had more pavement, um, our cities have grown, we have removed the vegetation from our, from our landscapes. And that's where the water infiltrates is into um, the vegetation in the landscape. And so as we remove that, stormwater is moving very quickly across our landscape and not infiltrating and getting into the groundwater. So that's going directly into our rivers. And so we're seeing the hydrograph or the amount of water in the river spiking at all of the all of the rain events. But if we're utilizing these rainwater harvesting strategies where we're holding water back um, because those quick rainstorms that we have in Colorado, they, they just run you know right into the river. So what we're doing is we're allowing that water to soak in and infiltrate or be used a little bit later so that water can make its way more slowly to the river and then more water is available later on. Um, and so it's actually really fascinating. Um, the city of Tucson had this river that was um, no longer running annually. It, originally it had run annually, um, but then it stopped because of all the groundwater pumping they were doing. And they're also using the Colorado River water, which is our water as well, but they had been supplementing with this um, groundwater pumping. And so they were moving that from their aquifers. And so the river stopped running. And so what they did was they started using rainwater harvesting as a strategy to, to save their river. And they've been doing this now for 10 years. And it is now um, very highly, um, 
that's what I'm searching for, um, encouraged and incentivized for the residents to utilize rainwater harvesting strategies to soak <coughs> that water into the ground. And now their, their river is back. Um, I know it's, it's amazing. It really is amazing what uh, rainwater harvesting can do. Um, did you see another The other question? beauty of some of this is that, um, like Jessica mentioned several times, the soil helps clean that water before it goes back to the river. So instead of picking up those pollutants, fertilizer, gasoline, oil off of cars, the soil is a natural filter and the plant's root system to clean it. So the water going into the river and into the groundwater and here in Colorado or here in this area, it's alluvial. So it's directly related. The river and the groundwater are related. And so if the river's high, groundwater's high. If the river's low, groundwater's low. 